Now, our first speaker is Dr. Richard Quack, a senior consultant, medical oncologist at Parkway Cancer Centre. He's experienced in general, general medical oncology with subspeciality interests in the management of sarcoma, gastrointestinal stromal tumours, melanoma and lymphoma. Today, he's going to be sharing more about paradigm shifts in oncology from past to future. Dr. Quack, please. Dr. Quack, lovely to see you again. Thank you. Stage is all yours. All right. Okay, thanks, Charmaine, for the very kind introduction. First and foremost, I'd like to thank the organizing committee, including the two chairperson, Dr. John Chia and Dr. Richard Pan, uh, for inviting me to give this talk, uh, as well as Mani and the rest of the group. So today I'm in task, uh, with talking about the paradigm shifts in oncology from past to future. Uh, and without further, further ado, I'll begin. Um, as a medical oncologist, we are always um, guilty of presenting too many survival curves. I promise you that in this uh, presentation, I'll limit my survival curves to just essentially a couple of them and just two slides. So sit back and relax. And so the overview for today's talk will be a recap of the past uh, um, uh, treatment strategies, the state of art treatment right now, and a bit of gazing into the crystal ball and to predict what the future might hold for patients and all of us. And so I think one of the biggest uh, advance of oncology is the multidisciplinary nature of oncology that's developed over the last decade to two decades. And I think no, we no longer work in, in silos anymore. We work as a team and a big team for that matter. And the patient first walks in and, and we make a diagnosis through the help of our pathology colleagues. We stage the disease with um, scans and radiology. And once we know the stage and the diagnosis of the patient, we then huddle to have a pre-treatment discussion amongst the surgeons, the medical oncologists like myself and the radiation colleagues. And this group uh, treatment strategy has really improved the care and, and not to mention the sub-specialization that's involved these days. And so as medical oncologists today, I'll just focus purely on systemic treatment and, and showcase what are the strategies we had in the past and right now, starting with chemotherapy uh, in the 70s and 80s and then the high-dose chemotherapy that we use quite a fair, fair bit in um, uh, blood cancers. Uh, in the mid-2000s, we have targeted therapy and the mid-2010s, immunotherapy. And so this is cytotoxic chemotherapy and, and, and it's got a bad name. Most of us are quite familiar with it and this works by affecting the, the rapidly dividing cells because it breaks the DNA. And so the rapidly dividing cells in our body, like the hair cells, hair follicles, the intestinal cells will also get affected. And while there are some side effects, I would say that chemotherapy still forms a big backbone of our treatment in our day-to-day -day work. Some of the side effects include alopecia, vomiting, neutropenic fever because the marrow cells are involved, mucositis, diarrhea, and fatigue. Um, so if you look at chemotherapy as a bomb, then the next development that came in our, in our sphere was targeted therapy, and that's more like a sniper. And so you need to have a target before you can apply a targeted therapy. And so this is what we typically see in, in our clinics. The patient walk in with cough, some breathlessness, and the x-ray shows a whiteout of the left lung. But a lot's going on in the left lung. You can see it's whiteout, it's not normal. But the mediastinum is shifted to the opposite side, suggesting a pressure effect. But clearly, there's also some gas sh shadow seen, at, um, bronchogram seen in the upper lobe, and also some gas shadows at the bottom. So it's not just an effusion. And if you go into greater detail, you can see a PET scan showing an entire lung wiped out. So if this was in the early 2000s, when I started training, we would say that this patient, we do a biopsy, confirm the lung cancer, and then apply first line, second line chemotherapy, and the results are very predictable. First line, four to six months of uh, disease stabilization response. Second line, maybe three to four months, and usually patients will do poorly after that. Now, for this patient, we did a PET scan. You can see that the imagery shows a very thick rind of tissue. So it's not in the lung itself, but it's in the pleura. So this thick rind of tissue is causing a lot of symptoms. And in this case, this patient has a lung cancer. It's not a mesothelioma, but it's a lung cancer. Uh, biopsy confirms it. And in this day and age, we do a lot of uh, genetic studies to look at the um, different types of genetic aberrations the lung cancer may harbor. And most common in our population is EGFR, but the list is now very long. It includes L, ROS, BRAF, MET, and so on and so forth. Now, once we find this mutation, then we can apply the targeted therapy, a right target, a right drug to the right patient, who give you a very good response, easily in the 70 to 80% range, depending on which target we're looking at. 
and that forms the basis of targeted therapy. So for my patient, in this case, we found L mutation. Applying the right target, you can see the symptoms improving very quickly and radiological response within a couple of weeks. So this is what we see these days in our uh, clinics with targeted therapy. Now, as the years went by in the mid-2010s, uh, the, the development of immunotherapy became mainstay of treatment. And as you all know by now, immunotherapy is specific to the immune system. It's not specific to the cancer. It's administered, it raises the immune system and uh, therefore allows the immune system to kill the cancer from within. And it's approved for use in stage 4 cancers and a broad range of stage 4 cancers for that matter. And I like to use a cartoon to illustrate this point. Again, you see a nasty looking cancer cell that the, the immune system is not able to recognize, which is in this case the, 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 the gut dog. It's tightly leashed, it's not able to recognize the cancer and the cancers then flourish. What happens, we apply a drug and this drug cuts the leash of the immunity and therefore the immune system then becomes elevated and goes about doing its job killing the cancer. And this is what is all about immunotherapy. And with the advent of targeted and immunotherapy over the last decade, and I'll just take one cancer as an example. In this case, I've picked kidney cancer. You can see the development and the paradigm shift uh, in these three big jumps. In the, prior to the mid-2000s, uh, we were using very toxic treatment, high dose interleukin, given in the, in the ICU setting. Patients have hypotension, they you know, fare poorly, a lot of side effects, and you get poor responses. Then by the mid-2000s, we have targeted therapy, in this case, uh, sunitinib, sorafenib, and then later in the mid-2010s uh, came about immunotherapy. We have a second-line therapy as a single agent and subsequently in a first-line setting, combination therapy. And the late 2010s, we started to combine immuno plus targeted therapy. And the response is very fantastic. What we used to achieve less than 10% of the time, we get 30% with targeted therapy and 40% with immuno. And in this day and age, when we combine both strategies, we are hitting 60%. And many of these responses are fairly durable. And this is the development I was talking about. Now, switching gears, we talk about melanoma. And stage 4 melanoma, as we all know, is a very deadly disease. And you can see the curve in yellow. Five-year survival, you're going to get 10%. That 10% of lucky patients, 90% will perish by five years. With the, the development of the first, um, first uh, uh, front-runner immunotherapy, which is epilimumab, anti-CTLA4, we raised the bar to 20%. Better, but not great. Five years survive, the, the, the median survival is still about 10 to 12 months, so probably about a year or less, so better but not fantastic. However, in this day and age where we combine immunotherapy, uh, as the patient walks in with stage 4 disease, we can then tell the patient that the median survival now is six years, 72 months. Um, so prior times, we would never have imagined that median survival would have exceeded five years, but this is what we get um, routinely these days. So this is what we have in the, in the standard of uh, care treatment, but what about the new approved treatments that we are anticipating? Started this year, anticipating next year, two strategies. One is CAR-T, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, and proton, which uh, Dr. Lee Kwan will go into greater detail in, a, in, a, in the second half of the session. I'd like just to touch very briefly on CAR-T because it's an exciting approved treatment uh, that's available now in Singapore. As you can see in this diagram, we have a T-cell. All of us have got T-cells, and T-cells uh, are able to kill viruses, cancers. But in this case, it's not able to recognize the cancerous B-cell, the, the lymphoma cells. So what's going to happen in this technology is that we're going to take the T-cells out. We're going to manufacture a chimeric antigen receptor into the T-cell so that the T-cells can then recognize the B-cell. It is then given back to the patient, and then this T-cell with this new uh, Armamentorium will then go after the cancerous B cell and thereby killing it. So this technology, we have got a cell therapy. It is a living therapy because the T cell is alive. It can propagate. It's got targeted therapy um, a modality uh, as well as immunotherapy because it involves the immune cells um, of the body. And so the process of, of CAR T therapy, we collect the T cells on the patient. We make the CAR T, manufacture it. In an off-site location, we reinfuse the, the, the cells to the patient and then there's a recovery process and that is fascinating. Now approved for use in leukemia and relapsed lymphoma. Now switching gears is uh, uh, radiation treatment. Uh, again, as I mentioned, Dr. Lee will go through in greater detail, but I love this slide. It shows a, a patient here surrounded by a huge machine generating proton hitting the target uh, the way it should. 
So there's a lot of back-end work and back-end machinery to support the treatment. And this is my cartoon of, cart of uh, proton therapy. This is standard radiation hitting the cancer cells the way it should, but unfortunately, these cancer cells continue because it's got energy. It hits the normal cells behind and in front the tumour. And this is where the side effects come in. Imagine proton. This is proton. hits the tumour very nicely and immediately it falls off. And this falling off will then result in the, the normal tissue before and after the cancer cells being spared. And this is exceptionally good for tumours in critical structures, such as the base of skull, critical parts of the brain, prostate, so on and so forth. So these two technologies are fascinating and they are available. Now, I was tasked to talk about the future of oncology as well, and I'll devote a few slides to this, and I'm supposed to guess what the, the, the interest of uh, oncology field will, will shift into. And I think two points. Number one is the adjuvant use of immunotherapy. Uh, adjuvant means prevention or preventative use. So far, we have given immunotherapy in a stage 4 setting where patients have relapsed um, terminal cancer, then we use this treatment. What happens if we use it earlier in stage 3 or stage 2 setting before the cancer relapses? Uh, I'm going to show you some slides and I'll bring you through this. And the second area which, of, which is of great interest to me is the antibody conjugate. And again, I will go into greater detail. So these are my two slides um, of survival curves. And this is adjuvant immunotherapy preventative use. We started in melanoma, and this is stage 3 melanoma. Stage 3 melanoma, the relapse rate after surgery uh, is as high as 50-60%. And so what happens, we apply the adjuvant immunotherapy before patients relapse, after resection. And you can see each time you do that, on the blue survival curve, it's at least 10-15% to better than surgery alone. And we select for stage 3 patients. And more recently, stage 2B and 2C patients also benefit from adjuvant immunotherapy, although not as much in a range of 6 to 8%. Switching gears, we look at lung cancer. This is uh, adjuvant nivolumab on the, on the left, uh, being applied to lung cancer patients before surgery. You see a response which is 10 times better than um, chemotherapy alone, and you see a better uh, response, a better event-free survival. And similarly, for stage 3 patients, after chemo radiation, you apply adjuvant immunotherapy, again, you see a survival benefit. And, and, and also in kidney cancer, in resected kidney cancer, stage 2, uh, intermediate and high-risk uh, uh, disease, uh, in kidney cancer, post-resection, you see again a event-free, disease-free survival benefit. And this is going to come in the next four or five years. You can see uh, adjuvant immunotherapy in a broad range of cancers, and we're just waiting for the data to come out. And the last... Um, topic I'll talk about is antibody conjugate. And I find this fascinating and I, I'm just waiting for more information on this topic. Essentially, again, a cartoon, you can see the cancer cell in orange it has a target. But unfortunately, the T cells that's patrolling our bodies are not able to recognize the cancer and therefore it cannot kill the cancer. What happens, we introduce a compound manufactured to uh, detect the target. It's got a red arrow that can detect the target. It's got a little tail at the back, it's called a linker, that can link in the T cells, which are the natural immune cells and it'll gravitate towards the cancer cells, and thereby allowing the T cells to clobber the cancer. And that is what we call a bispecific. You change the molecular structure a little bit, okay? And so you get a targeted portion, you get immunity, immunotherapy portion. Change the structure a little bit, change it to a chemo molecule, and you get an antibody drug conjugate. And, and, and the, the combinations are, are, are limitless. You can put a few T cells, a few chemotherapy, and then you can send it into the cancer cell. And this is where we anticipate um, uh, good results. In a way, it's quite similar to CAR T therapy. Uh, however, it is not a living treatment because it is a manufactured product, but the good thing is that it's off the shelf, so you don't have a lengthy manufacture process. So in summary, the paradigm has shifted in the management of cancers. Now cancers are treated in a multidisciplinary fashion. The treatment strategies have greatly evolved over the last two decades, and the pace of development has also quickened. Now patients live longer and they live better. And so with that, I thank you for our kind attention. Hand over to Shamin. Thank you very much, Dr. Quack. Yes, Looking I'm forward to the panel later on. Thank you. All right, we'll see you back on screen in just right. a bit. Thank you.